Welcome to SuperCloud 5, the battle for AI supremacy. I'm Lisa Martin here in our Palo Alto studios with Savannah Peterson. Going to be having four days of amazing coverage, talking all things AI. Savannah, it's great to be with you. The fifth special edition of SuperCloud. I know, I can't believe we're already at five. The SuperCloud series started in August of 2022. We weren't even in chat GPT territory yet. That wouldn't come until November. It's going to be a jam-packed four days here, both in the studio in Palo Alto, as well as from John and Dave in Las Vegas. I am thrilled, and I'm so excited to co-host with you. Same. I can't, with all the open AI debacle that's been going on, the controversy the last drama. 10 days, a little bit of drama. Yeah. I'm so excited to see where organizations are taking their customers on the AI journey, really to make it a reality. So I'm excited to hear that from our vendors, our partners, our customers across Palo Alto and Las Vegas. Fantastic, I, I am too, and I'm curious to see if there are any bigger predictions for who our winners are going to be, both on the generative side, on the traditional front, who's going to be powering this, and lots of conversations here as we close 2023 in the most exciting conversation of the year, artificial intelligence. I think our first guests are going to have some exciting things to say. To they get are. Howie Shu is here, AI and data executive. Howie, take it away. you got a great power panel next. Thank you, Lisa. This is actually a fantastic week because just a year ago, you know, the ChatGPT was introduced and then, you know, especially in Silicon Valley, so many exciting stuff going on. So with that, you know, I have two distinguished panelists with me, you know, Jerry and Andrew. I will let them introduce themselves a little bit. Uh, but, you know, for my first question to you is not just introduce yourself, but also, you know, you started a company about a year ago, right? Around the time ChatGPT was introduced. And uh, what's the mission, you know? And also, what's, what's the reason for the name of the company? Especially for you, Jerry, right? You know, Llama Index. You know, everyone knows about Llama. Did you borrow the name from Llama, from Meta, or wh wh what's the story? Great, so uh, just a brief uh, introduction. My name is Jerry, I'm co-founder CEO of Llama Index. And the thing I have to clear up for basically everybody here is that we came up with the name the week before the Meta model came out. Um, and so Llama Index actually has nothing to do with Llama, the model itself. Uh, but we were sitting on a couch. We decided to rebrand from our existing project, GPT Index, into a new name. And we were thinking of a cute animal. And we thought of a llama because it had the words LLM in the name of the llama, uh, you know, the, the animal itself. And so that's what caused us to basically uh, got, got us a rebrand. And we're really excited about the name. So great minds think alike, cute exactly. animals, basically. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then a week later, uh, Meta came out with the exact same. exact same. Uh, so what's the mission of Llama Index? So the mission of Llama Index is to connect uh, a user or organization's knowledge with the power of large language models. And so basically, uh, ChatGPT knows a lot about a lot of things, but it doesn't know about you, yourself, the individual, or you, the company. And so our goal is to take all that data that's sitting uh, kind of like private to you, uh, for instance, your PDF files, your CSVs, your documents, your APIs, uh, and basically figure out a way so that you can operate ChatGPT over all this data and do all the things you can do with ChatGPT. Got it. So basically a large language model indexing to data to do more wonderful things. Exactly. We'll get to more into that. Mm -hmm. Andrew. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Arjun, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Distill. Our mission is to distill value from technology for large enterprises. And that's really the origin of the name. It's, it's our mission. The technology we focused on to start the company is large language models. And our goal is to elevate the core business processes of every one of our clients to be more efficient, more productive, create new revenue opportunities, leveraging this capability and technology in AI. So I know you guys work with uh, OpenAI guys a lot, right? You know, what's the sort of the reason you started a company a year ago? Like you started a company like right before ChatGPT was introduced, right? So what was the background of you know starting the company? Yeah. So ChatGPT was this really interesting tailwind that happened after we started the company, but the capability that we actually got the most excited about was the ability to follow instructions. So when Instruct GPT came out. And to us, that was this aha moment where we realized that this wasn't just something that you could use to write letters or edit emails, which, which is great. But it's also something you can use to give instructions and actually carry out tasks that could have meaningful operational impact at enterprises. And that's when we decided to really form a company around this. And ChatGPT just gave us the tailwinds because then everybody started talking about it. 
Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, the instructor GPT, the paper was introduced probably a few months before you started a company. That was the aha moment you had to start a company, right? That's right. Oh, that's, that's a very good story. So, you know, with that, right, you know, this is actually the second installment I, I wanted to have with the generative AI industry. You know, in the first installment, about a month ago, I talked to executives from Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, right? Just asked them, hey, you know, how real, you know, is generative AI? All of them said, right, this is the biggest, you know, platform shift that they've seen in, in their career, right? They, they've been around the block for 20, 30 years, and then yet they said, this is the biggest uh, technology shift. At the same time, we all know that, you know, a year later, right, you know, the enterprise deployment of the production co-pilots or whatnot is still, you know, uh, small scale to, you know, I think to be fair, right? So what gives, right? You know, is that because there is some technology gap, you know, hopefully, or perhaps, you know, that's exactly what you're working on. Maybe we should just dive right into it, right? What is the biggest gap do you see when you work with the customers? And then what sort of the, you know, from technology point of view, the value you are providing? Well, I think what gets people excited about generative AI um, in, in general, and this might be why there's so much enterprise interest, is the time to value for knowledge automation and extraction is way shorter. Uh, you take an unstructured PDF, you dump it into the text window of your ChatGPT browser, uh, and it can just automatically understand what's going on, right? Or you'd copy and paste some code, copy and paste that into ChatGPT, it understands what's going on. So clearly there's a, a ton of potential here. And I think the reason people are so excited is because they're trying to explore like the upper bounds of what this potential has to offer. Um, of course, there's a lot of gaps too. I think, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of people are trying to build LM applications these days, uh, mostly to build prototypes, and they're finding it hard to productionize. And we, why? So we've written pretty extensively about this. Uh, there's a few kind of core issues. Um, one is uh, hallucination. Basically, the LLM itself, uh, given any sort of information you feed it, might not actually uh, understand some of the output sometimes. It's a stochastic black box. So there's always some error probability that it will fail. Um, the other piece is that a lot of people are building software systems around LLMs, and they're still figuring out the best practices for doing so. So for instance, when you combine the LLM, not just kind of as its own thing, but actually with a vector database or with other systems, then you add more parameters. And the more parameters you add, the more failure points there are. And so people are finding it hard to, one, uh, figure out how to properly That's because evaluate. errors compound, right? You exactly. Know, you have more components. Yeah, compound. And when you add more parameters to a stochastic system, the entire thing is stochastic, right? And so you, um, um, one is they're, they're finding it hard to actually how to figure out how to evaluate things. And then two is they're figuring out um, how to actually optimize all, the, all these parameters for better performance. So you write blogs or LinkedIn posts all the time, tweets, right? You know, just give us, you know, one or two things you wanted to share with the, you know, the audience here that, you know, the key things that you are passionate about and you feel like this is the things that you know we need to do yeah. much better. Than I, I could probably talk about this for an hour, but, but in 10 seconds, um, the main thing we're pretty excited about and the thing that we're seeing the most enterprise adoption is retrieval augmented generation. So basically uh, combining a knowledge base with a language model. And so this whole paradigm is called retrieval augmented generation, or RAG for short. And we've been investing pretty much the past six months of effort into this. And so we're excited to just like continue making this production ready. And we have a lot of enterprise deployments of our software. So with another 10 seconds, why RAG is hard, right? Because, you know, on the paper, right, you know, you just uh, do the retrieval, vector database, embedding model, boom, you, you retrieve top K contents. Why it's hard? Why it's so hard? So this is exactly where the point about adding more parameters to the system comes in. Because the moment you build a retrieval in addition to the language model, all of a sudden you have to think about how does your retrieval system work? How do you actually load in data, uh, ingest it, parse it, put it into a vector database, right, and embed it? And then how do you figure out how to actually retrieve it? And so um, a lot of current practices are relatively naive. Um, they're doing the most basic stuff, like you know, you split every five sentences or something. You use OpenAI embeddings. You do top K retrieval, uh, and they they uh, typically we've seen practitioners just like fix that and then not know how what, where to go from there. And so a lot of failure points aren't just due to the LLM; it's due to the selection of parameters at the earlier stages of the process. That's outside of large language. Exactly. Model. Yeah. Andrew, anything to add? Yeah. So, I think I just want to echo everything that Jerry said, he's absolutely right. Um, I think there's this misconception that to build an application with an LLM, you just need some documents, some data sources, and you connect it to an LLM and you get magic, voila. 
Um, in reality, what we have discovered is that it's a little bit more complex than that. And I'll break it down into two things. Number one is enterprise software engineering. And number two is the large language model itself. So for enterprise software engineering, this isn't new. We, it's all the set of considerations you need to scale to a large number of users, a large number of workflows, a large number of data sources, while respecting the access control postures that your organization has. And the good news is that we've been doing this for decades, but it still needs to be done. So we need to bring those practices over. Big data, you know, but it's a little bit different requirements, right? Exactly. Um, but you don't need those when you're building a demo or a prototype, but you absolutely need that if you're trying to create value from it. So that's the first consideration, which is the enterprise software engineering. The second consideration is the LLM itself, which, as Jerry said, is a little bit of a stochastic black box. And so there are all of these techniques and tools that you need to be able to make it work in a way that you expect it to work. And these range from data pre-processing and post-processing, instructions, and these are not well understood. Um, in fact, they're actually fairly custom. You need to work from the use case backwards to really understand what are the right combination of techniques to really make the LLM do what you want it to do for that particular use case. And if you get that right, the value creation is massive. But if you think of it as something that automatically works out of the box, then you're going to have a good demo, but you're going to be disappointed once it goes into production. And so these are really the two things we think a lot about when working with our clients. Mm -hmm. So in the past, right, we have been you know, to this point a few times from technology evolution point of view. Right? You have a new technology, but it's sort of fragile. Right? You know, it takes some engineering work. You know, the last decade, the way to solve this problem is just put that into the cloud. Let someone else deal with it so that I mm -hmm. consume RAG as a service, or consume engineering um, sort of the product as a service, right? Do you see that happening? And then if not yet, why? Yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely see that happening. Um, and I think uh, as to whether or not we're there yet, I think there's maybe just some factors in terms of just maturity of the technology and, and whether or not there's actually services that can uh, handle some of this at like, you know, production ready workloads. Uh, but what we're seeing is generally there's a lot of people coming into the AI space from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, there are the tinkers, that people that really want to get deep into you know, writing their own frameworks and prompts and all these things, and, and they really want to compose their own systems. And then you have uh, kind of uh, people on the other end of the spectrum that just want something to work. Right? And, and so there's definitely an opportunity for people to build services uh, for, to, to just make things work out of the box. Um, for instance, if hypothetically there was like a rag as a service uh, and it worked really well, people would use it, right? And there's some segment of people that would use it, and there's some segment of people so that would So we don't have a rag as a service today. Is that because rag so, as a service is so hard? So Well, also a case in point, right? OpenAI Dub Day two weeks ago, uh, or a few weeks ago, I mean, came out with, with like a retrieval API as part of their um, assistance uh, API, right? And so that is an example of rag as a service. And there are a few companies Yeah, GPTS that. essentially is a rag as a service. Yeah, right? exactly. If you but like there are some limitation, file, right? Upload up to, what, 20 documents or right. whatnot. Right, and, and we, we did like a quick benchmark, and, and it does like roughly like uh, maybe on par or a little worse than just Llama Index, like some, some tweaking of the You settings. mean the naive version. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and so, so there's definitely room to get better. And, and I guess the, the point is there's definitely room for rag as a service. There's a lot of interest in it, I, but I think just, um, it will probably take a few months for the mature for like the technology to evolve uh, to actually handle some of these like uh, performance um, like requirements for some of these use cases. So, Andrew, uh, what do you see the complexity of working with customers, Fortune 500 customers in particular, in, in your case, right? The complexity of you know getting rag done right. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it's important to understand how to address the different needs you have. So, I want to split really your requirements into two separate ones. One is workflows that don't require a lot of customization and aren't necessarily unique to you. And for those, I think your SaaS vendor is going to incorporate AI, and that's probably the best way for you to get value from artificial intelligence. Um, the thing that we really think about is there's this entire set of use cases and workflows that are categorically unique to you. And if you're a large enterprise, that's actually what differentiates you as a company. So what does it mean to incorporate artificial intelligence into those? And our biggest learning is that it requires you to work backwards from what your workflows are and what your company does. And that informs the choice of architectural decisions about what your 
AI stack should look like. It's different for a company that has predominantly structured data. It's different for a company that predominantly works with unstructured data. It's slightly different for a company that has a very large knowledge worker workforce, but work use case backwards. Um, and then once you understand that, you can then decompose it into software engineering best practices that allow you to scale up, and LLM best practices, again, just working backwards from the choice of use cases in a very first class way. So the way I heard about from you is like, we're still early, we're still figuring out, you know, the typical design pattern, working backwards, and we're not at the age of, you know, having cookie cutter rag as a service yet, because we need to understand, the, you know, the design pattern, and then figuring out that maybe perhaps, you know, in, you know, in the future, we will have the um, rag as a service, but, not, but not yet. I'm very optimistic and hopeful that l increasing parts of the stack are going to get standardized. But where we are today is a place where for it to work for you with the reliability requirements you have, you need to work from the use case backwards. So you and I had this conversation before. You mentioned that uh, you know, working on this part of the system is like uh, art and science, right? You know, can you elaborate a little bit to our audience here, like uh, the art versus the science slash engineering part you see? Yeah, absolutely. So the science part of this is just what are the techniques and what are the best practices that are well understood and are the same. And these largely fall into the bucket of things that are software engineering. So we all know how to do CI CD. Um, by the way, LLMs also require that because you need very high iteration speed. Um, so how do you do this in a safe and secure way? This is very much science when understood. Let's just do what works. Similar things for role-based access controls. The Where the art really comes in is there's an entire set of techniques about how you deal with the data, how you write the instructions, how you do data minimization, how you do post-processing after inference. And there's a little bit of art here of picking the right components and piecing them together in a way that really works for the requirements of this use case and the users that are trying to use it. And that's still very much art today because we're learning more about it. We have knowledge of the tools that we have, but what that comes together as a Lego set for different users and for different clients is still very much different. Yeah. So uh, we talked a lot about the RAG. What about fine tuning, right? You know, we haven't touched that word, but people talk about fine tuning a lot. What do you see? You know, you work with customers. Like, what do you see? Do we even need a fine tuning? Or is a fine tuning mature enough to be even brought to the table today? Like, what's the status? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the other buzzword in the AI or the Gen AI space right now. Um, I would say, besides RAG, uh, a lot of customers are, or users are thinking about fine tuning. Um, I would say no one has really reached a conclusive answer yet, even the people that are doing fine tuning. And the reason is, I recently talked to a few users who basically said that even if they spend a lot of effort trying to fine tune, uh, let's say like GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, by the time the next model comes out, you're basically just like kind of tr uh, a little bit below or matching the performance of whatever the next model will be. And so it does feel like some of this stuff uh, is going to be um, potentially a little bit of like uh, like a temporary effort as models get better, costs come down, and and generally like if you believe in kind of an exponential growth curve of the model capabilities over time, um, the the kind of like requirements requirements for fine tuning go down, right? But just very practically. Um, a lot of people are doing fine tuning, and the reason is that it, with a current set of models, it allows you to squeeze out better performance for less cost. Um, and so there's certain types of tasks that are very specialized, and you can definitely fine tune something much smaller and much cheaper uh, versus just uh, using like GPT-4 or GPT-3.5. Uh, for instance, like a classification problem or like a routing problem, you a lot of times you could just like fine tune embeddings or a classifier as opposed to an actual LLM. Um, I will say the proportion of people doing fine tuning, uh, it tends to range, uh, there, there's like two buckets. There's people that are like tinkering around because they really like machine learning. And then there's people that are in the enterprise and they're legitimately fine tuning to try to like bring their costs uh, down and performance up. Um, but typically that stage happens after some initial prototype um, a demonstration of value, and that typically occurs without fine tuning, just because it's way easier to set up. If you can just like take GPT-4 or 3.5 or Llama 2 and wire together a prototype, it's way easier to do without actually training the model itself, right? And a lot of times, fine tuning is this uh, kind of optional optimization step that people are still trying to figure out. 
Cool. Hey, Andrew, uh, we'd love to hear your thought, but also, you know, wanted to step back a little bit, right, you know. So Jerry talked about his view about the fine tuning. And I, you mentioned to me that, you know, your customers, some, some of them do not even use RAG, right, you know, just use the traditional, you know, information retrieval. Maybe just to give us a, a zoom out view, right. What are the different ways, right, you know, and then RAG versus fine tuning and uh, versus the traditional ways. And then, you know, talk about what, what do you see with the Fortune 500 customers? Yeah, absolutely. So one mental model that I found particularly helpful to think about this through the lens of is um, what serves the purpose of accuracy best. And when you're fine tuning, much the same way like when you're training a model, there is, there, there is information loss. Um, and so then the question you're really asking is, you change the weights of the model in the, in the case of fine tuning. Exactly. And what you're also in the process doing is like not all of the information you're giving it is being perfectly given, being learned by the model, um, which is why it's not the best way necessarily to teach the model facts, right? Um, what we have found is that the information loss from fine tuning um, is larger than the accuracy gains from treating it as an information retrieval problem outside of the large language model itself. Will that be the case forever? Probably not. I don't know. But what is very much the case today is decompose the problem into two parts. One is the large language model problem. And there, it's really good at planning. It's really good at picking the right tools, synthesizing. Summarizing. Summarizing, exactly. And then treat the actual data problem as an information retrieval problem, which could involve SQL in the case of structured data. It could involve RAG in the case of unstructured data. It could also involve information extraction to create structured data or knowledge graphs, which you then complement with the large language model. But we have really good techniques of doing high reliability and predictable information retrieval. We should be leveraging those. And we should be using the LLMs for where we know they work today. And it's going to be a work in progress to get fine tuning to the point where you can trust it for information as well. Where fine tuning is giving us value today is when you want to teach it things like brand, culture, style, um, things that aren't necessarily fact based. Output a format. Exactly, exactly. Um, where, you, where you have good guidelines and you can give it the necessary information for it to learn things at a stylistic level. So what both of you are saying is, you know, RAG or the, you know, the text to seek or whatever those kind of mechanism give you some pretty good data augmentation already. You don't always have to use fine tuning. And sometimes in some isolated cases, you see the benefits of fine tuning, but not across the board. And also, Jerry, you mentioned, right, when you see the model update, maybe you have a regression. So there's a limitations with the fine tuning. Yeah, I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but at, at a high level, I mean, one one big reason, right, out of the many, is is honestly just like UX. It, it takes a lot longer to to do anything by training the model versus just like using it, right? And that's also part of the reason why um, like GPT three, GPT four, like ChatGPT is so popular as an API because now any developer can just like call an API, get something, and build a software application with it versus having to you know, collect a data set, get human labels, um, train the model, like tune the hyperparameters, and then finally you get something that like, kind of works on this use case. Right? And so uh, that's kind of what, like fine tuning is basically the uh, training process that is reflective of like, traditional machine learning. Um, and so for that reason, it, it can be very powerful, like I'm sure, but it also just takes a lot longer. And I think for that reason, that's why a lot of people are just getting into this space without training. So before we wrap up on the technology side, there's one topic I cannot help but asking, right? Hallucination, right? You know, other than RAG or fine tuning, is there any other ways to sort of deal with hallucination? That's half of the question. The other half of the question is, what's the evaluation, right? You know, because this, you know, to your point, this is a, there are some art, right? Part of the art, maybe we need to evaluate the product very differently. So maybe start with on. Yeah. So I think what you're really getting to the heart of is how do you think about the reliability of these systems, right? Yes. Um, and so it's useful to decompose reliability into two parts. One is software engineering reliability, and the second is LLM reliability. For software engineering reliability, we have known best practices um, that, and we just continue using them. So that's number one. Number two is large language model reliability. And we think about this in a few different ways. Number one is you need evaluation data. Uh, interesting fun fact here, right? Like 
we used to have test and validation sets as part of traditional machine learning because you needed training data to build the model to begin with. And so machine learning engineers would just set some of that aside. Carve out. Exactly. And so there was this forcing function to make sure you always had. And the thing with large language models is because you're getting a pre-trained model, you don't need it. But I would really strongly encourage people to make sure they always have this. So that's number one. Number two is you need to be collecting feedback. So with all of the techniques that I talked about earlier, you can go from something that works well as a demo to something that has 85 accuracy and can work well with a human in the loop. But how do you go from 85 to 95 or 99? Well, you need to be collecting feedback. And this boils down to feedback in a few different dimensions. Number one, user feedback. Number two is actual logs of what questions are getting asked over and over again that you can use to inform patterns. And number three is observability analytics to understand which task is performing well, which model is performing well, which has low latency, and this can help involve and improve your adaptive routing techniques. Um, so collecting feedback is a very, very important part of actually improving the reliability and accuracy of these systems at large. All right, let me ask one question to you, because you are delivering the value to the Fortune 500 customers. There are probably 50 evaluation startups. Uh, are there too many? Are there uh, too little? Because <laughs> you know, on the one hand, I heard it's so hard to do evaluation. On the other hand, I, I've heard 50 startups doing evaluation. Well, what's your take? It's a really good question. What we have found is that you need to really work from the use case backwards. And there are some really interesting frameworks that people have come up with, but they aren't necessarily patterns and standardized choices. Um, what has really worked for us is just starting with the use case and working backwards, because we're still at that stage with LLM reliability where the problem selection is what informs evaluations. So, so what I'm hearing is it's not a solve the problem yet. Yes. Right. Jared, this is a topic that you are passionate about too. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I basically agree with everything Arjun said. Maybe just a few points to add. Uh, one is uh, basically along the lines of there's a lot of people from different backgrounds getting into the space, especially in the developer community. Some of them have experience training models and validating on evaluation data sets. Others don't, right? Especially if you didn't have like a traditional data science machine learning background. And so um, I do think pretty much everybody these days like building production grade ML systems should have some eye or view towards evals, right? And so if you didn't have that experience, you should at least learn some of the basics just because I think if, like understanding how stochastic machines operate requires some notion of understanding how to do evaluation. Um, otherwise, the, the, like, the way you test like a machine learning system is different than, yeah, like writing a unit test or integration test for, for software. Um, so that's maybe one point that I would add. And that's something that requires a lot of education and best practices and, and you know, like YouTube tutorials, blog posts, and those things. And we're investing like, uh, a decent amount of effort, both like kind of first party as well as through our partners, uh, our kind of like evaluation partners. Um, the, the second piece here is I think there uh, are probably starting to be like some emerging practices for like uh, standardized metrics for evaluation. Um, but as Arjun said, there's like a ton of like customization you basically need to make sure that the metrics reflect your use case the best. Uh, in terms of like standardized metrics, um, if you're building RAG, for instance, like one basic metric is you should probably think about retrieval, like just evaluate the quality of your retrieval system. And that is actually completely separate from the LLM. Um, and that you can basically just evaluate that, that, that like uh, evaluation of ranking systems has been around for like 10 to 20 years, right? Cool. So. Very good. So before we wrap up the session, there are two topics I wanted to discuss real quick, right? You know, one is use case. You know, we discuss technology. Many people know about use case, customer service, you know, the documents, all that kind of things. You know, uh, Andrew, you work with Fortune 500 companies. What sort of the use case you see that people don't talk too much about it, but you see that that's really, you know, the, the huge potential for Gen AI? What do you see? Yeah. I wanted to start out by saying something which I think everybody intuitively understands, but doesn't say it. So I'll just say it. The perfect GPT-4 application is yet to be discovered. And I think that's just important to be honest about. Um, so with that having been said, I think the first instinct that a lot of people have is customer service, right? Um, why? Because people have heard about it, and chat GPT is something that gives you a prior to think about that through the lens of. Um, where we, but I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Like, email drafting or customer service or um, marketing copy, I think that's the tip of the iceberg. 
where I think the real enterprise value is and where we're seeing people really get bottom line and top line benefits from is when you start plugging it into operations. And so the questions here are how do you make your supply chain more effective because I can more effectively retrieve information to make a supply chain analyst more, more productive. Um, I, can give better, I can do better decision making as a result of this. I can improve the standardization of choices that are made across an entire fleet because historically people were just making decisions in an idiosyncratic way. Now the artificial intelligence is able to retrieve the right information in a standardized way and create standardization across a workforce. And this not only improves productivity and consistency, it also frees up people's time to actually up level to do value added workflows. So in the case of, for example, one client, we freed up enough time from them doing reactive work to actually then be proactive to say, hey, I see that you have not ordered this other product for a while. Do you want to talk about that? Which is not even something they had time for because they were stuck finding the right data for two weeks. So what you, what you described is about you know, plugging gen and AI into the guts of the enterprise, exactly. how enterprise works, not just uh, you know, the documents, the customer service, you know, that's pretty cool. So you know, my last question to both of you, right? You, know, you have been, you, know, you, you started a company about a year ago, right? Um, after almost a year of the journey, what's the biggest learning? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of learnings. Uh, I would say one learning is has uh, probably just been the need to be adaptive. Um, I think it's always good things to change kind of, so fast. Yeah, every refresh week, your, you know, refresh your processes change. every week or every two weeks. Uh, it's always a good thing if you know after a month you realize that the current thing that you're doing isn't working because that means things are changing. You're probably growing as a company. You know, the things we did uh, when we were like two people between me and my co-founder are different than the things now with uh, nine people on the team. Uh, and so just, especially in a fast moving space, it's important to always just kind of reevaluate your priorities. Wow, you know, you still only have nine people with, you know, Llama Index. Everyone knows about Llama Index. I didn't we, realize only we, nine people. We doubled in size in the past month. Cool, month. cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last but yep. not least. Um, so I think the most important thing to, that we have learned from just having worked with our clients is what does it actually take to create successful experiments and adoption? Um, so I just want to start off maybe with the counterfactual of what we've seen fail. Um, we worked with many clients where you had a consultant come in and they would show up with these like menu of 50 use cases, which are very top down because they studied your 10K and they were treating it like a management consulting exercise. And the honest reality is most of those are terrible generative AI use cases. And also most of those are actually not going to really work. What we have found work most effectively at our clients is actually asking within because the answers are usually within your organization and it, things need to be bottoms up. So the best organizations definitely have some top down guidance in terms of governance, like what kinds of data can you use with AI, what can you not use, what kind of use cases you can use, just governance boundary conditions. But the sourcing and experimentation is a very bottoms up effort that involves the business users because ultimately they understand their pain points the best and the perfect GPT-4 application is yet to be discovered. And you're not going to discover it by studying a 10K somewhere. You're going to discover it by actually really understanding what the pain points are. And what this practically means is, by the way, software companies have already learned this, but I think everybody should probably hear it. Like The product manager is very important because the product manager's job is fundamentally to understand and be the voice of the customer. And then number two is designers are very important. So what we do is we do a lot of desk sites to like try to understand the user pain and really work backwards from that. Um, we think that more of that is what is necessary to create value, especially in the zero to one phase of value creation for AI. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Jerry, for giving our audience a glimpse into you know, the technology, right? you know, the, uh, the use cases. Right? And then last but not least, uh, the way you know, we should work with customers to sort of deliver value, uh, that deliver the value of the Gen AI to them. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.